Well, it is just so exciting now to meet a radiation oncologist who's had experience of proton therapy in the United Kingdom. Do you mind just introducing yourself, giving us a little bit of background uh, about yourself as a radiation oncologist, but then tell us what took you to the Christie and the focus of your work there. Yeah, sure. So my name's Unji Huang. I had uh, completed my radiation oncology training in Sydney. Um, and I was fortunate enough actually to be awarded the Thomas Baker grant through the college that I specialised through. And that affords uh, someone to go overseas for extra experience. Um, and my post through that was at the Christie Proton Therapy Centre, uh, which is the only operational NHS funded high energy proton therapy centre in the UK. Um, and so I had first-hand experience in working with patients uh, receiving proton therapy. Uh, it was an invaluable experience. As you know, with proton therapy coming to Australia, there has to be work in preparation, in training up the necessary people for that. Um, and so my hope was to really bring back some expertise and also see what people around the world are doing very well in this space. Look, before I ask you the key questions I have for you to deepen the knowledge of our, our viewers uh, to what proton therapy is and its potential benefits to certain types of cancer patients, just off the top of your head, what are the three key things you'd tell uh, a fellow radiation oncologist that you've learnt about proton therapy? Okay, a fellow radiation oncologist. Yeah. So I would say that I view proton therapy as another tool in the radiation oncology sort of toolbox or tool belt. It has its place and its purpose for specific tumours and in specific patients. Um, I like to emphasise its uh, yeah, potential promise, as you said, Julie, um, and the exciting uh possibility of it reducing side effects in patients, particularly in our younger patients. Um, yeah, but th th that's really what I would focus on. So there's a, it, it's cautious, it's qualified, but it's optimistic. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> My understanding is that we have to understand dose distribution to fully understand the potential benefits mm -hmm. of proton therapy. And you've got a diagram there. Can you show me on the diagram yeah. what yeah. this dose di distribution is all about and why it's so crucial? So I think it is best explained through a diagram rather than using lots of words to try and explain what this graph shows. Um, but this shows really the difference between conventional radiotherapy as it enters the human body and proton beam therapy. And so if you look at this green line, this is conventional photon or x-ray therapy. And when it enters the patient, it is highly penetrative, but it deposits it most of its dose maximally within the first few centimetres upon entering the patient. And then eventually it does reach the tumour or the target here, but as you can see, there is quite a bit of normal tissue preceding that tumour, what's called organ here, that will receive some radiotherapy and also beyond that tumour, what's called exit dose. In comparison with a proton beam, which there's two ver versions here, basically this shows one um, proton beam and this is modified to join them together to create a, a, a spread out Bragg peak. But just in simple terms, when you look at the proton beam, it enters the patient, it's a charged heavy particle. And when it enters the patient, there's less dose or low dose as it enters the patient and it actually de deposits most or if not most of its dose in this region called the Bragg peak. Following that there is a sharp drop off. Okay now why is that terribly good for patients? Yeah so it's terribly potentially, potentially. <laughs> <laughs> because if we can determine and manipulate the Bragg peak to be in the region of the tumour then in in many ways, we're getting our bang for our buck here while sparing normal tissue before and after where that tumour dose is being given. So in a nutshell, you must be now doing research, these new teams with proton therapy. You're working on getting the maximum beam to hit the tumour and do as little damage as possible going in and hopefully no damage going out. <laughs> That's the nub of it. But some people, once proton therapy is in Australia, will still be getting normal 
conventional True. radiation therapy. So this is a slightly challenging graph, isn't it? Well, I mean, we have to take it in the context that um, this is in its purest form. You know, in the real world space, um, every tumour, depending on its location and its size, the bigger the tumour and depending on the location of that tumour, proton therapy may not afford this benefit that we're seeing on this graph. We start losing that benefit the larger the tumour, for example, and in terms of its location, its proximity or its you know, closeness to other very critical structures, if it's still very close, we can't spare even with proton therapy because we still need to get that dose in. So all within context, um, and each case needs to be um, looked at individually, which is why I like to see proton therapy as a separate tool, not necessarily one to replace conventional radiotherapy. I guess the big hope that a number of the people we've interviewed have talked about is the reduction in long-term side effects. Indeed, one of the radiation oncologists or one of the doctors has said the side effects initially may be pretty similar for many patients yeah. to conventional radiation therapy, but the hope is that the long-term side effects will be significantly reduced. Yeah. How is that based on modelling or on clinical research? Tell us what the strength of that evidence is. I think that it's a bit of both. Um, the reason that um, that's been said uh, is because the low and medium doses we're seeing are the ones being reduced, whereas those high doses to those normal structures that are very close to where we're targeting are difficult to spare with any form of radiotherapy just by pure geographics of where things are anatomically. So the low and medium doses are, are shown to be reduced in dosimetric modelling, um, and that we know equates to late effects, late effects meaning decades, um, which is why the interest group really for this form of therapy are the paediatric and the teenage young adults because they have many years to manifest these late effects. So that's really where the strength of um, the advantage of proton therapy lies. I, I think that diagram and the Bragg peak has illustrates so well the great potential reduction in long-term side effects for some patients if they have proton therapy, as I understand it, because there could well be less damage to surrounding healthy tissue. But in each individual patient case, there may be characteristics of that patient or the tumour or its location that will mean the pure benefit is not realised. And I wonder if it's possible to tell us a few examples to illustrate the, sign, the kind of difficult judgments a, a team of a multidisciplinary team will be making when they look at an individual patient in Australia and decide, will we give this patient conventional X-ray therapy or will we get them on an aeroplane to Adelaide mm. because we think proton therapy will be better for them? Yeah. Because sometimes it won't be an easy black and white decision, will no. it? No. And often that decision is actually d uh, dependent on what we see when we sort of map out what happens potentially within the body in terms of the doses if proton therapy was given. And what we're seeing in dosimetric studies is really that lower dose or the medium doses, not the high doses, the low and medium doses being reduced with proton therapy compared to conventional radiotherapy. And whether or not that makes a difference is, as you said, a very a clinical judgment depending on each case, particularly to do with the size of the tumour, but also the location of the tumour. I guess an example is sort of just off the top of my head is that if there was a tumour right down at the bottom of the spine in a young female, let's say, then that tumour, because of its proximity to the nerve roots of the spine, it might be that when you compare conventional radiotherapy with proton therapy, the dose to the spine, because it's sitting right on it in that case, is comparable. But the dose, let's say, is slightly further away in the pelvis, and for someone who's a young female, it may be of great concern to them about the dose to the ovaries, which only need a very small dose to be affected, and that can have fertility impacts. So it might not be that we're sparing the higher dose around the actual target itself, but the lower doses in the pelvis, a little while away, but still fairly close by, is reduced. But the clinical consequence of that can be quite significant. 
Another example may be we do treat tumors in the region in, inside the head called the base of skull, which is where the brain sits. And there can be these rare tumors called sarcomas that, that emerge there. Again, the nerve roots around that area may be similar in terms of the dose they receive with radiotherapy conventionally and proton therapy, but the hearing apparatuses or the hearing structures that we use for hearing uh, called the cochleas, a little while away from there if the size of the tumour is appropriate and they may be spared compared to having conventional radiotherapy. These are probably my two best examples right now. Thank you. And, and it allows us to see some of the complexity of the judgments. I want to come to the issue of research because there are these contentious debates within the radiation community happening I think within Australia about the relative merits of the increasingly precise and sophisticated conventional radiation therapy options and proton therapy and there's big debates happening about that. What are some of the key research questions that are going to need to be addressed in these first years of proton therapy in Australia? And what are the arrangements to ensure we're all collecting data within Australia and hopefully internationally in a common way so we're building up a body of knowledge that can benefit the patients in five and ten years' time? Sure, yeah, that's a big question, Julie. So there is some data out there about proton therapy, um, but the sceptics will uh, say, understandably so in many regards, that the data is insufficient. Uh, so there is an ongoing effort now and into the future about collecting the necessary data. And I think really the data priorities in this space are to do with outcomes. So outcomes in terms of survival and local control, you know, how good are we at controlling tumors um, and how are people surviving with the proton therapy. Also though, patient reported outcomes, so the patient experience in receiving proton therapy and the logistics around that, but also of course the side effects or the toxicity outcomes, what we call, um, in terms of early and late effects. I think it is important for us to be able to coordinate on a national and an international level the type of data that we collect because it really gives us an opportunity once we can collate those patient and those tumour characteristics to make more meaningful uh, conclusions and mine that data in a more meaningful way. And is that collaboration occurring already in Britain. We've, we've interviewed, uh, you were working at the Christie in Manchester uh, at, when you were a fellow there, and we've interviewed people at the Christie, and we've also interviewed people at University College Hospital London, is it University College London Hospital's yeah. proton therapy unit, and they're talking about um, collecting common data. So, is, so can we be optimistic as patients and families that you're all working together to get the best data? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the UK is a, a great example of that. Um, having only opened really operational protons um, through the NHS system in the last few years, the UK has recognised very sensibly that collecting data uh, consistently and um, conscientiously from the outset is very important to contribute to the literature that's growing about proton therapy. And having two national centres um, to try and coordinate that effort is going to only exponentially maximise what sort of data they're getting. Um, so yes, I, I know firsthand that um, the data that they're collecting, they're making sure that the nomenclature or the data items they're collecting are consistent and the types of things they're collecting are also consistent. Can you explain what a patient registry is in the cancer research world and then tell us what's happening there with proton therapy? Yeah, so a patient registry really provides an opportunity for every patient that's receiving proton therapy to have their details uh, collected. This, you know, in terms of their patient characteristics, in terms of their tumour characteristics and their treatment characteristics. The importance of that is that it really maximises each patient's treatment as an opportunity to collect data about protons which we need. Um, the reason I think that that's most important is it's collecting real world evidence, isn't it, in terms of what's actually happening. We can look at graphs all day, I suppose, but looking at the clinical effects of what's actually happening when we deliver these, this treatment to real patients um, and you know, using that as a, a resource to be able to mine that data and, again, make 
meaningful conclusions. So is one set up in Australia already, do you know? Yeah, so that's a a huge effort um, that's being um, put together in terms of making sure that when the centre is operational, um, that first Australian centre in Adelaide, that there is a, a a corresponding patient registry that's ready to go to collect that data. The overall theme of these uh, webinars is, you know, what can we do to improve the radiation experience, including proton therapy, the radiation experience for patients and families. And we have done a whole feature on the CRISTI. Uh, But as someone who spent, I think, a year there uh, working, three or four of the things they're doing there that you think really add benefit uh, to patients, particularly the the children, adolescents and young adults. Yeah, no, they're doing lots of great things there, um, which I'm sure you saw as well as you've interviewed people there. I think the really the key thing that they're doing well is really their holistic approach to their care and management of patients, particularly children. And this goes from looking at details such as providing accommodation for people who live far away and this is weeks of treatment sometimes you know five six seven weeks of treatment providing accommodation um, that's funded for them accommodation oh sorry so accommodation as also as transport daily to receive their treatment there's also a school provided within the center so that education um, is being continued for the children in as you know as as sort of similar a way as back home. Um, Equally, they really designed the space thoughtfully to be appropriate for paediatrics. There's also a separate corner for teenage young adults. Um, And I think another crucial thing that they've um, incorporated within their staffing is someone called a key worker. And this is not necessarily someone who's Uh, nursing trained or radiation therapy trained and can be either or but it's someone who really walks through a treatment journey uh, consistently with the parent and their family or an adult um, and it becomes a familiar face and a real point of contact for patients who are trying to navigate all these different cogs um, within their treatment journey. That's fantastic well look thank you so much you know it's just been enormously interesting to get the benefit of your uh, experience in the United Kingdom. Were you glad you uprooted yourself and went to the Christie to learn about this new technology? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Even though, you know, during global pandemic times, not something I expected and it did cut my time slightly short. Um, but the, the experience I had there, the knowledge that I feel like uh, I was exposed to and was involved in, in the clinical care and just seeing how, how well they're doing, um, implementing a lot of what we've talked about from the outset, um, I wouldn't have changed anything. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. Thank you.